It's time for the Property Podcast, where every week, tens of thousands of property investors, new and experienced, join together to get news, knowledge, and laughs at our expense. With me, Rob Bentz. And me, Rob Dix. Join us every Thursday morning for your weekly dose of property ideas and motivation. Then head over to our website at thepropertypodcast.com to keep the conversation going. Now, though, let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Property Podcast. It is episode 130. I am Rob B. He is Rob D. And we've got another great show for you. At least we hope so. Of course we have. It's going to be a little bit of a different one, actually. I think often we sit down and we plan these out and we sort of go, okay, well, here are the five key points that we want to get across, the bits of advice that we want to give relating to this topic. And sometimes we have debates where Rob thinks one thing, I think the other, and we'll thrash it out on there. This isn't really one of those. This is more of a discussion. Um, We're just going to have a chat about this topic of should you play to your strengths or work on your weaknesses? It's a topic that we talked about in the past and we were having quite an interesting conversation about it. So I think, well, let's just record this conversation and hopefully other people will find it interesting too. And it'll sort of spark some ideas for you. And of course, we're going to relate it all to property because that's what this podcast is all about. Of course, we've got a resource and we've got a news story as well. But first... A little bit of self-congratulation, maybe? Can we do that? Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. So the Property Investment Tips book has been out for half a year. Wow, that's gone really quickly. It's been a massive success, and that's because of you. So thank you so much. Well over 200 reviews. Um, the Currently the best-selling book in the whole of the property market industry, which is bonkers, more reviews than any book out there which is just crazy including books that have been out for a decade but the one that we're really chuffed with is that it's remained in the business top 100 on amazon since it launched so six months now it's been in the top 100 so it wasn't like an instant surge and then it fell away it's been in the top 100 for six months which is which is just bonkers we just wanted to mention it because really just to say thank you thank you so much for supporting it and thank you to all the people we know who've actually found the book on amazon and then found the way to the podcast so hello to you but either way thank you so much for getting behind it and leaving so many reviews you know we've got a few friends and family but not over 200 to leave reviews and they're coming in week by week it just the flow continues so we're just really overwhelmed with it and we just wanted to acknowledge that and let everyone know on the podcast so huge thanks yeah and it's brilliant because i've seen lots of new threads on the forum recently people saying they found it via the book those people will hopefully go on to attend the in-person meetups on the first thursday of every month and we'll basically be bringing this whole community together and good things will happen as a result of it so the book is definitely playing its part in that and we are super grateful and talking about success stories this week's news story You would have thought that becoming a millionaire would be a success story, but apparently nothing special anymore. Yeah, every Tom, Dick and Harry's a millionaire. Well, at least one in 65 of those Tom, Dick and Harry's. Because of property prices and the stock market's doing well also currently, as we record this, but you never know with the stock market, there are, as I've said, one in 65 in the UK are millionaires, according to the Daily Mail and their article we'll link to in the show notes. Rob, it seems like a big number, but what we were talking about off air is London, which it doesn't actually mention in the article, but we found in a previous article once, London, it's one in 12. You've got a good chance if you're outside of London, but if you really want to increase your odds, you need to move in. But I've got a feeling that might not all be hard graft, as we've said, and it might be those who are just sitting on property in the right areas, and it's gone up by an exceedingly high amount. Yeah, so if we see a bit of a dip or a correction or whatever you want to call it, that number might change dramatically. And if I can just do my Jeremy Corbyn bit for a minute, that doesn't tell you anything about the distribution of wealth either. But I'm not going to get into an economic or social debate with the Daily Mail story because nothing good ever came from doing that. Instead, we will just link to it in the show notes, which this week are at thepropertyhub.net slash strengths or weaknesses. So this episode, I think it's going to be really interesting for you because you'll soon find out if we invite you to the pub or out for a meal, whether you want to spend time with us, because this is the type of thing we discuss. As Rob said, we were, we were having this chat and we thought, no, let's just, let's just flick on the microphone and, and have a chat. So it might not be as fluid as we normally are. We don't know because our chats normally aren't recorded. The whole reason we're doing this is we started talking about strengths and weaknesses. This point came up originally and, and we'll go from there and, and see what happens. But the point is, in school, we're encouraged to get A's across all our subjects if possible. And if we excel at one subject, 
then we're then told to right, work on the others and get yourselves up to A's as well. Why are we encouraged to work on the subjects we struggle on and put the most effort in there? And why do we have to limit ourselves to A's? Why is there a limit? Why not we push to really focus on our strengths and just be competent at our weaknesses instead of spending 80% of our time working on the stuff we're not actually that good at, whereas we've, we spent 80% of the time on things we were good at at school, then we could become masters of them. That was really where we started with the conversation. And then we've, we've turned the microphones on after that because we thought, oh, this could be interesting. Yeah, and I think the point about school is a really interesting one because I think that there's there's generally a lot of guilt around just being particularly good at one thing and weak at other things. Even though when you look at highly successful people, they often are extremely talented at one thing and they've gone after that area. And there might be 90% of subjects that they know next to nothing about. Even though you see that, that pattern in successful people, obviously it's not the only way. But I think if you are that kind of person, if you're, if you're really talented at one particular thing, and maybe someone comments on that to you, your natural reaction is to go, oh yeah, but you know, but I'm, I'm rubbish at maths or, or, whatever, or whatever. You kind of, you kind of draw attention to the things that you can't do because there's this thing that's ingrained from quite young that you're meant to be solid across the board. So that's, that's an interesting one, Rob, because the self-depreciation aspect, I don't know if that's British or a universal thing where we, we seem to, if someone points out something we're good at, I do it all the time. I'll go, yeah, but I'm, crap at this and then point you know point out something i'm not good at and so many people do it i don't know why we do it another example of it is work and this comes to the aspect of flow which i'm sure we can touch on you find sometimes you know moving on from school now into work life you know whether you own a business or you work for a company you can do a task that you're really enjoying really getting into flying through it and then you almost step back after you've done it and gone all right that was really fun now better do some hard work (laughs) it's like the the hard work might not necessarily be more valuable but you give yourself hard work to punish yourself almost for doing the fun work this really came about because i listened to an interview with a guy called roger hamilton who whose resources we'll touch on later on he really made this point that the stuff that we enjoy we shouldn't see as wasting time because if it's valuable and we enjoy it, we should just do more of it rather than then finding out tasks that you've really got to grind at and work hard at because that might be just that you're not that good at it, you know? And if you're not that good at it, could someone else be doing that? Could If you work for someone else, could you speak to your boss and say, listen, I'm brilliant at this and I can do lots of it better than anyone else, but this part of my job I'm not so good at. Can someone else do it because I can add more value here? And if you're working in a business, then should you work hard? harder on the stuff you're really good at i mean a prime example rob is i love doing the podcasts i love doing the content creation um the stuff that we work together on like this is great fun and sometimes i feel guilty and go and do some really boring admin afterwards or some real grunt work just to make me feel like i've done a hard day's work even though this probably is one of the most valuable things we do yeah absolutely and we will bring this back around to property i promise but let's talk about bodybuilding first Oh, as you do. Um, but let's talk about our friend Arnie, who seems to come up all the time, because this is like an interesting sort of almost a counterpoint to what we've just been talking about. So we, we've just been saying, you know, if there's something that you're particularly good at, focus on that thing and not punish yourself by focusing on the things that you're not good at. But Arnie's approach to bodybuilding was that he was really an all rounder. He knew that there were areas of his body that were really strong, but then there were others that were weak. And most bodybuilders at the time, before he became the dominant force, they had a couple of things that were really spectacular. And that kind of hid their, not flaws, but their areas where they weren't as strong. So the approach that Arnie took to be the best was that he worked on absolutely everything. So if there's one muscle group that was lagging, he'd just go in and he'd absolutely smash it until it was as strong as everyone else. So Whereas you'll see people in the gym who've got really big biceps and they are really proud of that. And so they'll just sit there and do hundreds of bicep curls in the mirror and feel happy with themselves. Arnie would be there working on his back or something like that because he knew that's what needed to be done. And that's how he came to be the best. And if he would just focused on what he's good at, he probably wouldn't have been that all rounder. And I think you can see that in the approach that he took to business as well. 
Because if you look at Arnie, he's been successful in so many different things, including areas that he really had no right to be good at. So he was a guy who came to America without speaking English. Even when he did speak English, he had quite a strong Austrian accent. And he went on to be one of the biggest movie stars in the world. That should never have happened. But he worked on his weaknesses until they got stronger. And then he even turned his kind of quirks into a selling point. It's almost like with him, his strength is just figuring out how to be successful and powering through. And it seems like whatever he puts his mind to, he can make it happen. It's interesting. I don't know if that's like a model that can be replicated or if he's just a special case. But it does give an interesting counterexample to the thing where you can just kind of see a successful person who's become that way just by getting really, really good at one thing. I think the Arnie point really throws the cat amongst the pigeons with this because it kind of does say, well, well, you should work on everything from that point of view. But what I would say is successful people from the outside do seem like they're good at everything. So you look at people and you go, wow, they've done this, they've done that, they've done this. They just must be all rounders. But, you know, we've done a few things and we're nowhere near on the success level of Arnie. But we have very strong skill sets in particular areas. And then we are very weak, both of us, in different areas. Now, you could say, well, if they're complementary, then that works. But actually, there are things that both of us are rubbish at uh, as well and um, we have to bring other people in but from the outside in it could be like well you've got all these things happening and you've got all these successes so you must be good at everything we are pants at a lot of things really bad but the perception might be that we're good so it could be with arnie i'd definitely take the bodybuilder points on board and he even talks about it he had an assistant almost from the very beginning and that assistant was doing something for him and maybe she was doing the the admin or the that type of work that he wasn't particularly good at and he was more of a leader it's interesting you i don't know because i've never spoken to arnie but it could make an interesting discussion plus he is very big on mindset a kind of counter arguments out there rob is like footballers if you look at football you see you know the world's best at what they do if you look at your Cristiano Ronaldo's or your Suarez's or whoever you want to look at, those two in particular are dead ball specialists. So people who are very, very good at free kicks, they just seem to get it in more times than they miss. And it's not because they were always brilliant at it, but they clearly had a natural talent for it. And in training, you'll see them over and over again practicing at these dead ball situations now they do all the other general training as well but let's face it the coach the manager isn't suddenly going to say well you're a good player so i'm going to play you in defense because that's not their strength their strength is being up the top of the field scoring goals and then when needed scoring these free kicks because they've just practiced on what they're already good at and just honed that skill you know, penalty takers as well. Um, Steven Gerrard, clearly being biased here, but he was a world-class penalty taker. And it wasn't because he was rubbish and then became good. He clearly had some talent, but just worked on it and worked on it and practiced and practiced until he became one of the world's best at taking penalties. There is definitely the Arnie argument, but in the other athletic sports world, there's the counter arguments as well, the, the footballer case. So I don't think it's clear one way or another, but you can definitely see this merit for, for both. But that probably brings us to striking a balance, as you said before the podcast. Yeah, exactly. I think that there is a real balance to be struck between these two positions because you made an interesting point when you were talking about about Arnie and having having an assistant from the start. It's like, yeah, I just listed a load of things that he's really good at, but maybe he is really rubbish at doing admin. I don't know, but let's say that, that he is. It wouldn't make any sense for him to take time out from everything he's doing to sit and crunch through paperwork if he's rubbish at it, he doesn't like it, and there's someone else who can do it for him. Conversely, uh, we've got people on our team who actually really enjoy admin and are brilliant at it. And that's not a skill set that should be devalued at all because it's, it's actually really important and not many people are good at it and enjoy it. So it can look like someone is really good at everything, but actually everything encompasses quite a lot. And you can't possibly be competent at all the different subsets of everything that you're going to come into contact with. But I do think that there is a balance to be struck because if you've got a natural talent and you can develop that and become highly, highly skilled at that kind of thing and turn that into profit, then that's great. But if you're completely ignorant about everything else, then I think that can lead to trouble. 
So I've got a couple of examples. One, one you'll come with me on and one I sense that you might not. If we take this into a property context, let's take um, something that we talk about a lot, which is using a mortgage broker or a mortgage advisor to arrange finance. We repeatedly say that you should use a broker because they are going to save you time and they're going to be able to have knowledge of the market that you can never have because they're doing it day in and day out. And yes, you could sit there and read through all the criteria of all the different lenders, but it's just you're still not going to be as knowledgeable as they are and it's going to take up a load of your time. So it's better to just pay them. However, if you know absolutely nothing about mortgages, then how are you going to know if they're doing a good job? You're not going to have the confidence to hire the right broker in the first place because you won't have any kind, of, any kind of intelligent questions to ask them. And then when they're doing a good job for you, you won't know how to judge their performance and you won't know if they're doing everything that they should be for you. So there's a balance to be struck. It's useful if you do a little bit of reading or a little bit of listening to kind of know the outline of the area so you can then judge other people's performance. Another example where I feel like I might be out on a limb, but I've previously recommended the um, Collins DIY manual because I would never dream of doing a DIY job myself. It would be a terrible idea for everyone involved and anyone who comes into contact with my work. But when it comes to having a project that needs to be done at one of my properties, I feel like if I know nothing at all, then I'm not going to know how to hire the right person. I might get fobbed off on things. They might just try and blind me with science and charge me double. And if they say something's going to take two weeks, well, is that reasonable? Is that ridiculous? I have no idea. So by having a basic bit of knowledge, it means that I'm better able to hire and better able to judge performance at the end of it. So I think while this discussion, while we're both going in the direction of, like, yes, you shouldn't be ashamed to be really good at one thing, you should be happy to work on that. There is kind of a balance to be struck. Rob, you're completely right. I'm not going with you on the DIY thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I I do get the, the wider point, though. And if we bring it back to school, maybe it is if you are good at something, become a, a star, 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 star student at it, even though it doesn't exist, create your own category, become a real master of it, but at least be a C grade in all the other stuff. So, you know, don't be used, don't be complete fails, but have a base knowledge, be a reasonable standard at most things but be a real A player, top, top A player in the thing you are good at. I agree, you know, in, in what we do in, in property and in business, I like to know a little bit about everything just so I feel more comfortable. However, I must admit, I know nothing about DIY. I have zero interest in about knowing about DIY and I just I just rely on referrals and, and trust. But maybe that could get me into trouble, but normally referrals keep me out of trouble, so... DIY is not one I'm going to go with you, but I accept the wider point. Let's bring this back to property because it's we've discussed a lot here. We've discussed about strengths, weaknesses, finding your flow, mastery. But how does this all relate to property? Well, some potential examples could be, and we mentioned this with Rob and I, but Rob and I partner really well. There are things we are both good at. But then there are things that we are individually good at, which helps us spread across and, and do a better job overall. It's exactly the same with property. If you can find a JV, someone who's maybe, you know, a simple one would be, if you're great with the numbers and great with deal finding and stuff like that, but you've got somebody else who's great with the hands-on stuff, a builder perhaps, then that on paper could be a great partnership. Of course, there's more to it than that. But those opposing skills could be really useful. Yeah, and I'd also say that if there's something that's, working for you then don't feel like you need to mix it up just for the sake of it so if you're following a strategy where you're just buying properties that just need a very quick lick of paint and they're good to go you're buying at a good price you're not getting absolute bargain basement going out and leafleting to get things 40 percent bmv or whatever you're just you're just doing it and it's simple and it's effective and it's working to you and it's going to get you to where you need to be in the long run don't be embarrassed about that. Don't feel like you need to go out and do all this wacky things because everyone else is. And this is a danger, I think, of the more you learn about property, the more things you learn about, you can feel like you're just always chasing the next thing. You're looking at the, what the guy over there is doing. You're like, oh, well, maybe I should get a piece of that. I don't think there's anything wrong with staying on track. By staying on track, you're ultimately going to get further ahead than if you're just kind of messing around with all kinds of different things. And the same goes for individual aspects of property as well. So if you are 
really good at picking up properties by forming a relationship with with estate agents getting the nod from them grabbing things as soon as they come on and that's your your method of sourcing and you've been working really hard on that network building those relationships and checking in with those people comes naturally to you then don't feel like you need to go off and start becoming an expert at buying at auction and like flicking through all the auction catalogs and and going out to the viewings and everything else by all means, partner up with someone who has that as their approach. And so you can swap leads where appropriate. But don't feel like you need to go and do that. If you've got something that's working because it's what you're good at, keep doing it. Yeah, and you can even take it one step further. If you like property in general and you like the results it brings you, but you don't want to get into the, the daily grind of it all to get there, and you're a good manager or you, a project manager or a leader, and you, you could just oversee different things, as we've said, we use experts for the majority of the things we do. You know, you can do that as well. You can be completely hands-off in property if you want to be. If you prefer to use experts for every step of the way, you can do. And maybe that's right for some of you. And some of you it won't be because, you know, some people go, but I love getting stuck into X within property. And that's fine. Keep plugging on. But if you haven't got a particularly really strong strength in any aspect of property, Just become a C standard in the subject so you know you're not going to get in trouble and then let the people who are the A star, star, star students do the work for you and just just oversee what they're doing. That's what makes this really interesting. There's no right or wrong way and it really comes down to you as an individual. I think that leads into the the resource, Rob, if I can jump into it now, that the resource we've given you this week is personality tests. Um, Roger Hamilton, who I mentioned earlier, created these tests. They're called talent dynamics or wealth dynamics tests. The talent dynamics is a test they use for for all the people who come to work at RMP who get to really understand their personalities before they start with us. I mean, we may even not offer them a job if it, they've got a real personality clash with the role, but it really helps you understand who you are, what you're good at, and also, just as importantly, what you're not good at. Now, it may you may go, oh, wait, wait a minute, that says I'm not good at that. I've probably used the wrong term there. It's more what's in your flow. So you may find that you're quite proficient at admin, but you don't like it but you say you could say well i'm good at it you know i've I've always delivered results in that side of things but if you don't enjoy it it would highlight hopefully if the test is to be believed what's what's in your flow and what isn't Uh, wealth dynamics is the same thing but it's just more for individuals so talent dynamics is more for hiring and wealth dynamics is just for the individual it's really interesting stuff and we'll link to it in the show notes this week which you can find at thepropertyhub.net forward slash strengths or weaknesses that's the property hub net forward slash strengths or weaknesses so something a little bit different this week rob um, we'd love to know whether you've enjoyed this episode or whether you're gonna plumb neck guys get back to the bread and butter will you let us know if you like this sort of camp sit around a campfire or sit around a pub chat that this is the type of stuff that rob and i discuss off mics then if you've enjoyed it let us know we can do more of this and if it's not been your cup of tea let us know as well so we don't give you the stuff you don't like but we've enjoyed it anyway yeah, we have. We're happy to keep the microphones off in future if it's bored all and sundry. But hopefully there's something in there which will get you thinking, maybe give yourself permission to to focus on what you're good at or give yourself some ideas for, for plugging the gap in in some of those weaker areas. So you can go from, it Rob's a really good analogy, to go from like being a fail to being kind of a C grade and to make sure that you've got that element of balance that we're talking about so you can get into your flow but know that you're not going to be let down by things falling down in other areas. So I think a really interesting topic, and I must say, I've never done any of those kind of tests uh, that you were talking about, Rob, but it's something that I will do. I've always been a bit kind of bit skeptical about one of these things where you get put into like one of eight different boxes at the end. It kind of feel a little, getting a little bit close to horoscopes or something when you try and categorize people that precisely. But it's something that I know does work. And I, it's something that in property people talk about a lot and we've got amazing results from getting that clarity on, on where their skills are and where they fit in. So that's something I'm going to look into further as well. Great. Okay. Well, we've enjoyed that. But something else we enjoy, of course, is our five-star reviews, which we keep bringing us in and we're so grateful for. Manny Manny this week says... 
The knowledge provided by the podcast is pure gold. To impart their knowledge so selfishly, Rob and Rob are an example of how to give and help fellow humans. They are a fine specimens. <laughs> I'm an excellent landlord and a homeowner. I've listened up to episode 48 in one week. 48 episodes of one week. And I've been motivated to reevaluate in my buy to let. And I'm about to half my mortgage, something I certainly would have been sitting on. Thanks a lot, Rob and Rob. Love you long time, Manny Lester. <laughs> Thank you, man. We do appreciate that. A great review. And if you'd like to leave us a review, hop on iTunes. Um, you don't need to love us a long time, but if you love us a little bit or even like us, then please go to iTunes and leave us a review. We would appreciate it. Yes, we would. So that's us for another week. Do let us know in the Property Hub forums what you felt about this episode. Next week, one that you'll hopefully enjoy, Five Myths uncovered about property investment oh mysterious indeed so back to the the bullet points and action points next week but as i say let us know what you think of this episode you can comment at the propertyhub.net forward slash strengths or weaknesses that's the propertyhub.net forward slash strengths or weaknesses where you can find all the show notes and all the links we've mentioned in this show but until next week when we'll be back with those five myths uncovered have a wonderful week everyone bye 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 Thanks for listening to the Property Podcast. Make sure you join our mailing list at thepropertypodcast.com. And remember, we love five-star reviews. Rob even loves them more than air miles. Yeah.